the left wing is completely empty. Is this a political statement? It's about terrorism. <laughs> this is a panel about terrorism. <laughs> It's interesting, thrilling, suspense. Okay, whatever, ladies and gentlemen, we, we very much appreciate your, your presence here, even though we know it's late, but it's going to be exciting. For those of you who have not uh, met um, Ezzedin Shukri Fischer yet, I think most of you are aware who he is, but I'm introducing you again, try to keep it more you know, brief than I did before. He is a former uh, diplomat. Well, technically, he still is in the diplomatic service of Egypt, but he took a, a leave for a couple of years for good reason because he has become a very successful novel writer. He um, lived in uh, Canada for some time and did his PhD on global governance and globalization in 1995 in a time when the topic of globalization was a rather new one in the, uh, in the international uh, academic world as well as in media. And he served in two very, very interesting um, diplomatic missions. He was an, an, an observer to uh, the Darfur crisis in the Sudan And later on, he became a member of the fact-finding uh, commission uh, in the investigation of uh, the assassination of uh, the former Lebanese Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri. So, though you have learned, uh, Shukri, to um, approach conflict with a more diplomatic uh, instruments, you are you have you have seen, you have met, and you have encountered violence, and you and and it is also. In the in the the costume of terrorism, a very important topic in your early writing, because what happened is when uh, Shukri was uh, in the, still in the diplomatic service, he published uh, some books rather secretly. It wasn't, uh, you know, he as as a as a as a serving member of of, of, of uh, at the service of the government, he was not supposed to publish books, so they circulated, and it was uh, until 2008 that his name became you know, uh, publicly known as being uh, a writer. And since then, uh, these books sell very well in Egypt. The topic of our last panel is literature and terrorism, which is a very wide angle. And when I did the, uh, uh, some preliminary research about this topic, I just realized that there is not much published on, on, on this yet, neither in the academic world, not in journalism, which is actually strange because, at least in the Western media, Since 2001, since, since the attacks of September the 11th on, uh, on uh, New York and, and, and Washington, our media are full of this topic. And it was until 2011 that they were replaced by something different, which was which what we refer to as the Arab Spring today. Shukri, do you think that the age of terrorism is over? This is not a literary question. This is a political one. Yes, I think it's over. And um, that's a blunt answer. You have to explain why. Yes, I will. And but first, I have to also explain that this is not um, a security um, expert advice. So if <laughs> if I am to um, give an advice on this, I'd say um, it's over. But things take time until they actually disappear, if they ever disappear completely. But terrorism. Um, terrorism has been with us in human societies for a very long time. If you read the history of terrorism, it's quite interesting and took various forms and um, outlived political ideologies and so on. So as, as a political violence that targets civilians specifically is unlikely to disappear completely. But terrorism as a form of political protest, as a political phenomenon, as an important political tool... As far as the Arab world is concerned, I think is over. And I think that the um, assassination of the killing of Osama bin Laden, um, and that's probably the literary side, it's kind of emblematic in the sense that it, as if as a tragic hero, he had to exit stage when his role was over. Um, on that stage. And I think what happened with, Arab, with the Arab Spring, um, which is still at the beginning, is um, two things. And those are the two reasons why I think terrorism is over. One is that an increasing number of people, of, of Arabs, realized that there are other 
forms of political protest that are much more effective and actually much more fun to do and less costly. And um, this is acquiring acceptance by increasing number of people. The other thing is that the Arab world is refocusing its attention where it should be, looking at it own, its own problems, identifying its own um, causes or social systems that do not work, um, especially the political systems, and trying to find out, to, to actually trying to either fix them or replace them or find out how you can take them from where they are to a better place. And in doing this, they're not, I haven't met anyone in Egypt who is, during those 15 months, who's focused on the outside world. You know, the West is after us or, some, you know, the external. In fact, those, the regimes are using the external threat and conspiracy to repress the people. But the people, their attention is elsewhere. It's their own regimes, how to fix them or to change them. In this sense, I think terrorism as a global phenomenon that involves targeting Western civilian populations or, target or, or, or individuals is largely over. So the idea that terrorism is something which is mainly identified with the Arab or the Islamic world, um, do you think this idea is also going to vanish from our media? Is it going to vanish from our perception of the Middle East and of Arab societies? Because what we see in the last year is uh, a, a, you know, a thrilling increase of sympathy. All of a sudden, things which, you know, we couldn't imagine this in the last years, things from the Middle East and the Middle East itself, the Arab world, is somehow cool. It is somehow admired. It is somehow heroic which is a very new phenomenon. I don't, I don't think we ever had this in the West. Do you think this image is also going to, is, is going to be replaced by something, something else? Well, the way images persist and change is tricky, and there are many actors involved in creating the image and sustaining it, and you know, there, it, it's a whole struggle. Um, so it, I wouldn't venture into predicting whether the image itself will stay or for how long. But if you look back at the history of terrorism, in the 60s, terrorism was associated with other factions, political factions, and in the 70s. And then they go, and unfortunately they get replaced by some other association. I think the, the question can be answered only in relation to the broader issue of the image of the Arabs worldwide. And I agree with you that the images coming from Tunisia, from Cairo, and other cities present the ordinary non-Arab with something that he or she is not accustomed to. And um, looking at the, uh, new, the artists, for example, the graffiti artists, the singers, all these new forms of expression, a lot of people are surprised, just like, really? Um, you know, those are Arabs? And I understand that because we in Egypt had the same reaction. We were in Cairo and we were watching our co-citizens in Tahrir and just like, really? Are those Egyptians? Because we're not used to it. So what happened actually in the last 15 months is a discovery of ourselves. By our, we're not doing this for show. We're not doing this to impress the Germans. We're actually discovering ourselves. And there is, this is my claim, what's happening in the Arab world is not, about, is not only about overthrowing dictatorships. It's a cultural revolution. And if I, am to, if I am to bid, if I am to compare this to something, I would say this is comparable to the second, the later half of the 60s in France, in Europe, in the United States. It's a cultural change. What you see is a new generation who thinks differently. It is not just that they express themselves differently. They think the machine itself, the way they think, is different. And this will change a lot in the Egyptian and the Arab culture and in its expression. Is this going to filter how fast this will cross the sea or the ocean? 
there is a market dynamics as well, so I can't answer this question. But the reality itself is projecting different images. And I think, maybe I'm too optimistic, but I think it will be hard to ignore those different images for a long time. But still, there are, the, the concepts are there, and they somehow, uh, you know, um, uh, there is some kind of osmosis between the old concept of, you know, self-sacrifice in the, in, the, in, the, in the terrorist way and the concept of self-sacrifice in the, in the approach of the, you know, protesting young, young generations. For example, I think for many Westerners, it is not easy to understand that the people that fell on Tahrir Square were called uh, martyrs. Because when we have, whenever we hear the, word, the term martyrdom, we think of, um, you know, suicidal, suicidal attacks, people blowing themselves up in buses. You don't think of Christian martyrs? Not so much anymore, because maybe, See, because maybe, change. no, because maybe this is very far away from us now. Yeah. This, like, you know, it's the, the idea of martyrdom is something which is, you know, we, which is not very present in our Christian culture anymore. Well, good for you. Look, um, I attended part of the previous discussion here. And um, then it turned into German and I, I left. But before I, I, I left, the, the, um, um, the person from Yemen, I forgot his name, Ali, I, I think, Mokri. Ali, was, was um, criticizing the youth for reproducing some of the old slogans, uh, political slogans, including, uh, you know, go and fight for your country and this kind of militaristic. The new is not 100% new. The news coming out of the old, and the old is not gone completely. And this martyrdom business is staying with us for a while, and it's been recovered. Also, some of the jargon of the left, of the old left, uh, is, is, is coming back, in, in, at least in the Egyptian case, in songs and the ways in which this new phenomena is being portrayed. But I think we need some time. You need to allow some time for things to settle down and for this new wave to kind of take shape. There is also the issue of Islamism and where this will end up in the new setup, if you want. Is it going to, what, what form it will take, what discourse it will adopt, and so on. All these, we're watching something that is still being made. And it's, it's difficult and it's a bit foolish to kind of come to solid conclusions. But the dynamic is a dynamic of a much deeper change than what meets the eye. Well, then there is the, the, the issue of passiveness. If we look into Western literature on the Middle East, you would, like from the last, I don't know, 200, 250 years, um, passiveness, which is like affiliated with belief into the destiny, into fate, which is already, you know, it's it's written in the in, in 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 the big book, so you cannot change your destiny. When it's and this is something that I also experienced traveling throughout the Middle East, talking to people that they are not. I mean, they they, they don't like death more than they than than, than than Europeans, but they have a more maybe self-imposed, more relaxed way of dealing with it because they think. When it's over, it's over, and God knows when. I don't, but I cannot change my destiny. Is is this a, a Western cliche of the Arab soul, or is there truth in it? And did this probably change within the last couple of years? Clichés have some truth in them. They're not, in, you know, entirely made up. The problem with clichés is precisely this: uh, you know, you you rest on a bit of truth, and then you generalize, and then once you generalize, it becomes. You actually not only you indoctrinate, so the the subject kind of embraces your generalization, and then I think, okay, I'm Egyptian, I'm Arab, I have to believe in destiny and all that. It's probably Greek where it started that destiny business, but anyway, it's I think today, and this is it's it's actually a very good example of the cultural change I am referring to. If you If you ask the average um, Egyptian, um, average education, average social background and so on, about if you give him, uh, not her, if you give him a new, you suggest a new idea, the old culture is to take the idea and compare it to some repertoire that the person has. It could be a book, 
um, holy or not very holy, or some kind of inherited wisdom. I say, do we do these things? And she's like, yes, we do or we don't. And then you get the answer. If you ask the average person on Midan al Tahrir, give them an idea. Okay, let's, you know, instead of going through elections, let's have a, a presidential council um, for a transitional period. The, what do they measure this against? They measure it against effectiveness and against the future. Is this going to help us get where we want or not? This is a difference in thinking. Your reference, your foundational authority, either is external and kind of fixed, or you make it as you go because you have goals and you want to reach them. It's difficult to measure it, but you can sense it if you deal with people on daily life. And you talk to the old politicians about the same issues. You talk to them about Muslim brothers, should we build a coalition with them or not? And then you talk with the young Regardless of the answer, the answer might be yes or no in both cases, but the reasoning behind it, the argumentation, the mental operations are completely different. This is a difference in the mentality. This creates difference in the culture. So what you see today, if you map out, maybe is not very different from what was there a couple of years ago. But the, because the dynamics and the mentality of a growing number of people who are growingly engaged and taking part in public life, I think this will lead to a fundamental change. Well, if we look back at the last, let's say, 20 years of literature, we have examples of where um, terrorism was considered, let's say, this is more a media, a media image, uh, a very evil thing which has been committed and, 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 and uh, pursued by people that are brainwashed, that have no free choice. They have never chosen to do this, but they have been indoctrinated and brainwashed and they, they are just, you know, creatures of pure fanaticism. <clears throat> when, you, when we look into your own literary work, you have described, and some of your, I wouldn't say heroes, maybe anti-heroes, but some of your characters in your books have chosen the path of violent resistance. Well, I've already said chosen. Well, you should have said that. Uh, the path of, of violent resistance and of terrorism, of uh, unmeasured violence. So are you, uh, do you belong to the apologetic school and say the terrorism was the necessary outcome of the political systems? No, no, I don't. But I don't belong either to the first group who uh, wouldn't want to look at things that they don't like. Um, the cliche present representation of terrorism as those are insane people. They're outside the realm of the rational. And therefore, we cannot talk to them or communicate with them. Because this is the George Bush kind of um, exclusions. You actually establish border of humanity and you push, you push these almost creatures, outside the border of humanity. And in doing, this is not an innocent operation, because in doing this, you justify measures that usually you wouldn't use with the, those who are within the boundaries of humanity. So this is a political process. But I'll take you back to you know, more hardcore reality, if you want. Even if you, even if you want If you are engaged in combating, and actually those who are engaged in, in anti-terrorism were the, the first who understood that this representation is superficial and useless. In the literature, in the political science and literature, the studies um, of especially on suicide bombings, the first wave was they're crazy, indoctrinated. Just. But then the second and third wave realize that those are actually rational actors. This is called the strategic use of violence. And there is, this is not, you know, some Egyptian uh, political science. This is standard anti-terrorism. And therefore, you start to devise your anti-terrorism um, strategies based on this assumption. You look at the choice of suicide bombing as a strategic choice, and you try to avert it and so on. One step closer to literature. For I write about the things that I care about. So I didn't start by writing about um, terrorism. I started by writing about 
Egypt in the late 80s, beginning of 90s. And Islamists in this, in the first of this quartet, the Islamists were um, the others on university campuses who are against freedoms and so on. And then the second uh, novel in the quartet had no Islamists at all because this was the actually the last half of the 90s. They were the days of the severe repression and so on. They were all in prisons. But then in the last two novels, Islamists were back. And they were back as a component of the Egyptian society. You have four characters and all four different people and all are facets of Egypt, if you want to put it in a kind of simple way. And they're all guilty and victims at the same time of what they do and their predicament and so on. And then the novel where you have the hero is actually engaging in terrorism and becomes um, a fighter with Taliban. Which is the killing of Fakhreddin? Or, this or is the Abu Omar al-Masri. And Abu Omar al-Masri is his nom de guerre, if you want. He's, his name is Fakhreddin and he becomes Abu Omar al-Masri in Afghanistan. Um, you can read it, uh, you, if you read it, you will see that there is some sort of understanding or analysis of where this comes from, of the reasons that lead normal people like Fakhreddin, who's a, a, a lawyer, to end up in the mountains of Afghanistan killing people he doesn't know. And then you'll see how the, where does this lead him and so on. And I think in literature as in anything else, understand. I find joy in understanding and I find joy in describing, maybe this is why I talk too much, but that's my job. So, I, you know, if I tell you, oh, they're crazy, that's the end of the conversation. I don't know if, this, if you learn anything from this. But if I tell you the story and explain the background and take you to look at a reality that you see, but you look at it from a different perspective, this, it's easily disagree with that perspective, but I think there is more richness in doing this, more humanity in a way. Well, there is... An interesting peak in the uh, history of r literature de dealing with terrorism, which is the 1970s. It's basically the early 1970s, I think, when, when Europe was for the first time not only confronted with its own terrorist groups, but also with the Fedayeen, for example, plane uh, abductions, k kidnappings, uh, hijackings and so on, uh, bomb attacks on airports, which is something very new. And it, in, in these years, um, uh, Nagib Mahfouz wrote his uh, novel Mirrors, in which, which he bases on the, on the, the bio biography of Sayyid Qutb, who was kind of the, one of the leading, you can call them intellectuals, of the uh, Jamaat Islamiyya, of the, 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 the violent Islamist resistance groups in, uh, in uh, Egypt. So in these days, we also had this, you know, very, very hot and harsh, very, very hot debate about, you know, how how deeply should intellectuals try to understand terrorism? Heinrich Böll, the patron of this foundation, wrote his book, um, The Lost Honor of Katharina Blum, in which his main character ends up shooting a journalist from a tabloid newspaper. And, uh, you know, this was all created in the environment of the, the terrorism debate and a certain terrorism paranoia also in, in, in Germany. Um, do you see... If you if you compare like the European European perception of this uh, like dealing with terrorism and the uh, the way Egyptian uh, intellectuals dealt with this, do you see uh, an analogy? Do you see parallels between these two, or do you think these are worlds apart, different phenomena? One, um, I I'm not an expert on um, how European literature depicts terrorism, and I actually when I wrote the um, Abu Omar Masri, haven't thought of it as a novel about terrorists. Um, it's a chapter in a long journey of that person. And it's interesting also that this chapter gets your attention uh, more than uh, anything else in the novel. But I think that's it is perfectly normal. People, uh, you know, look at the things that they're more interested in. Um, I think if you, if you read crime novels especially those that have a psychoanalytical part in it. I think you can see an, an interesting parallel with novels dealing with uh, novels dealing with terrorism. Is, do you want to read about 
the guy who killed the woman and then we find out who's the killer at the end and that's it. Or it's more interesting to understand the killer and understand you know, what was he thinking when he did this. I wrote a short story about um, somewhere between short story and, um, and the testimony about Tahrir. And one of the questions I raised is the snipers, those who were shooting young people in Tahrir deliberately, those snipers in their head, what were they thinking? Do they choose their victims or do they, they say, okay, I'll shoot at this, no, no, the other one, or how do they do it? And this is something, actually, I would like to explore more. I would like, I think it would be an interesting novel to write about one of those snipers and his life, where he comes from. How do you end up being a sniper and you do this kind of work? Or being in a torture room? And what kind of relations you have with your family and your neighbors and, and this kind of thing? Are those interesting novels or are they apologetic for murder? They're well, if, in, in Europe, uh, we have um, there, there's almost an obsession of if you look at you know Hollywood or, or, or even French cinema with uh, um, you know trying to understand serial killers or even making um, professional killers, prof- professional assassins, heroes of movies, and uh, they they have exactly. They, yeah exactly they have even starred in comedies as as, as main characters. So um, do you think do you think such a such a story would would work well in Egypt at the moment? Well, Abu Amr Masri worked well and it had a bit of Tarantino in its uh, gruesomeness on how violence is depicted and the killings and so on. Um, I'll spare you uh, more description. But I am not sure when you do this, you know, let's take Tarantino. When you watch this, do you banalize violence and make it more acceptable? Or do you make it more ridiculous? I'm not sure. I don't know. But I think it's interesting to do. There is some interest in, you know, I find it interesting. Um, When I wrote in Abu Amr Masri this chapter that is, Abu Amr is basically in the company of Osama bin Laden, except he's not named. So he, you know, he's not working for the Taliban. He's not even faithful. He doesn't believe in God necessarily. He says he has more questions than answers about God and religion, all of that. But he ended up there because he wanted, you know, that's the story. And then because the Arabs who were in Afghanistan with bin Laden had had to take sides, so they took the side of Taliban and he ended up in a truck as a sniper for the Taliban protection. So he kind of protects the convoys. And then it goes into... The question of being apologetic or justified, it's far from, I think, you know, the novel is not moralistic in a sense that it doesn't tell the reader. But ultimately, what Obama cares about most, which is justice, is not achieved. He can't achieve it by violence. He discovers it. At the end, he discovers how empty the whole quest was, despite the fact that he mastered all the skills he wanted. His son, who is the dearest person to him, the mother has passed away. His son is hurt by his own colleagues and not just physically, he's hurt psychologically from all the violence he sees and he rebels against the father and the the group and the Islamic Jihad and so on. And he betrays them to the security services. Um, So the damage... So when you enter into the world of violence and allow yourself this bracket and try to understand, look at it as people who do things for reasons and what they think and their psyche and all of this, you might actually understand certain things that are more interesting than just de- depicting them with a, you know, a, one of those generalizations. Do you think violence is more a part of, of, of the human condition still nowadays in the Middle East, in the Arab world? I mean, this is an image that we have, at least. Then here in Europe? That there's a higher level of acceptance of violence I should, and yeah. just violence. I'll probably refer you to one of my critical theory colleagues um, in the political science department who would talk to you about structural violence and 
um, implicit and explicit violence and the domestication um, versus something else. But um, personally, I don't think that the categories we're using as Middle East and Europe are very useful. I think, quite the contrary, they are misleading. I'm sure you will find on all, in all areas, you will find people who will continue to believe that violence is either necessary or more effective. They can do it from a legitimate perspective, so they can be army officers and police officers and tell you, just cut this nonsense about education and delinquency, it's just... You have to show you know, a tight fist and then the neighborhood will be in order. And you will find empathy for this. And then you will find the others who would hopefully, um, with the Greens, uh, where we sit, hopefully that will find that you know, it makes more sense to invest in education and public education and inclusion and so on than in just order and police. And so. It's everywhere. Um, is it more in the Middle East than in the Far East? I, I don't know. And I frankly, I don't think it's necessary um, a useful um, question. Useful questions and remarks from the audience, please. Just a moment, please. There is a microphone on your left. Just like, for example, uh, children that are mistreated and then they develop a psychological problem or emotional processing problem in future and then you think about the cause of it and all that. And if you consider like terrorism, something like a malfunction, malfunction of the brain, like when you say they are crazy people, then you have to ask yourself what kind of um, environmental problems or what was what was the causes of these um disease or whatever you call it. And uh, I was wondering if you have any idea or comment telling that what kind of environmental or political uh, situation can co make development of such a malfunction. I'm not sure I described it as, um, I think I was making fun of those who call him crazy. But that's okay. I think it's a social and political malfunction, essentially. Um, yes, people make a choice to use violence, and I think it's a wrong choice. I think morally it's unacceptable to hurt innocent people, regardless of why are you doing it, because actually no one cares why you do it when you're the target, at least. But I think analysts and sociologues and political scientists and those who care about understanding social and political malfunctions should care why they're doing this. And then this is, but, but this is an old debate about the root causes of terrorism. And of course, you know, there are those who don't want to hear about it. All they want to hear about is the security response. And I think you can breathe and chew gum at the same time so you can do your security response if you want you know keep spending money on security at airports um, but maybe pay some attention to the social and political malfunctions and i think we have a huge experiment going on in parts of the arab world and if they proceed successfully more or less i think you will have much less of the malfunctioning It's not going to be the El Dorado. It's not going to be the end of the social and political problems. But the major dysfunction that was there for decades is probably going to disappear. And then we will have other problems to worry about. The microphone is here. Oh. Thank you. Uh, as far as I have understood, you are writing in Arabic. You write your books in Arabic, your novels in Arabic. So in this case, um, I suppose you know um, Muhammad Ashari from, uh, from Morocco and uh, Fawaz Haddad from Syria, maybe also. Ashari won the Booker, uh, Prize. Booker Prize for Arab fiction last year. I hate him for that. And uh, so that would be my first question, why? What do you think about his writing? And uh, have you heard about Fawaz Haddad? Because I was um, intrigued to see that they are writing quite from, from a quite similar perspective. Leftist's father who uh, would see his son go to jihad in Afghanistan or 
Iraq, respectively. I, I thank you. I heard, obviously, they're both famous, um, and I haven't read their work, to be honest. I bought the Ashari one because he won the Booker Prize, and I was hoping I'll get it, maybe if I buy it, but it didn't work. Um, but I, I, I can't comment on, on, I just know of them and um, haven't read them yet. That's my fault. No, no, I, that was a joke. I, I should stop making jokes. That's where... No, no, because he won the Booker Prize. Because he won the Booker Prize. I was shortlisted and didn't win. So it's a... But forget that. Just... <laughs> I should get more serious. Then. Well, any more jokes? <laughs> Questions? Remarks? None. Such, such a hot and, hot and thrilling topic, you know. Usually, people throw shoes at you when you talk about well, British and terrorism. So. But the Arab Spring has 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 calmed the spirits, or is it the fatigue? I don't know. Well, we very much hope that we can uh, soon read your books in, in in German, in English. Some of them are already available, certainly on Amazon too. Not yet. Not yet. We are, we are working on this, and we are working on your Booker Prize, and we wish you all the awards possible, and we also hope that uh, your prophecy that the age of terrorism is over, is over and that we could deal with more interesting and more constructive things, because there is a lot to work out. I'm not sure if I have the last words to... I'm closing this panel now, and I thank you very much for coming here and for being here and for, you know, it's 10 o'clock, for missing Tat Ort. But, um, Christian, I think, you know, as as uh, Christian and Florian, as the, the curators of this wonderful weekend and all the Heinrich Böll crew, I think you should have the last words because I'm just your humble employee for this weekend. Yeah, probably they should all come here now. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. I make it very short. Um, some of you, einige von Ihnen, ich glaube ich gehe besser wieder zu Deutsch. Einige von Ihnen waren über die gesamten zwei Tage hier. Ich sehe einige Gesichter, die viel viel gesehen haben. Ähm, es war wunderbar diesen Ort mal in dieser Weise bespielt zu sehen, mit diesen wahnsinnig tollen Gästen von nah und fern. Und ich möchte Sie herzlich einladen. Ich möchte Sie herzlich einladen, jetzt noch den allerletzten Teil des Programms mit uns zu erleben. Sie haben ihn schon gesehen, Ahmed Aseri. Er hat eben hier kurz zwei Lieder gespielt. Er wird jetzt noch ein kleines Konzert geben. Wir richten das gerade ein. Das heißt, wenn Sie das noch erleben wollen, würde ich Sie höflich bitten, zur Treppe zu gehen, sich noch was, wenn noch was zu trinken da ist, zu nehmen. Und dann legen wir gleich mit dem Konzert los. Viel Spaß dabei noch. Herzlichen Dank für Ihr Kommen. Applaus